Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to session two of the Affinia Healthcare Leadership Academy. I'm happy that you're here. Just a reminder, um, we'll go for about an hour, not longer than an hour and a half today. I would ask you to silence your telephones and other devices so that we don't have that distraction in the case it, they ring through. Um, today we will talk about HRSA and the regulatory compliance of community health centers. That's our topic for today. First, in this second session of 19 in a series that goes until sometime next April, April of 2020, we will provide you an, an academy overview today. Federal law and regulatory bodies is a topic for today, as well as compliance for community health centers under what is well known as the health center program. Please, if you have questions, don't hesitate to start at any time. Uh, raise your hand anytime you wish, and uh, I'll be happy to take the questions as we go. Uh, the series is open to all staff at Affinia Healthcare. I think that has been well established, and it's intended to broaden our understanding of various topics related to management and leadership in health services. So the first two in the series, the last one that was two weeks ago and the one today, specifically about community health centers, the environment within which we work. The remaining 17 will be more generalized to the healthcare environment, uh, healthcare management and leadership and health services in general. Uh, your participation is voluntary and it's free of charge. Also, these sessions are being recorded. They will find their way to the intranet uh, as, long, as well as your uh, PowerPoint slide deck, uh, copies of which you have today. So we will have these available soon and running, uh, uh, available and running for all other staff who wish to take part. Uh, topical information for this series will come from the American College of Healthcare Executives database, the National Association of Community Health Centers, and other credible sources. I like to say I won't be going to Wiki, I won't be finding some, some uh, information out there that is not substantiated by good research and good uh, scholarly vetting. And finally, certification, certifications, <laughs> certificates. <laughs> Affinia Healthcare will offer a certificate at the end of the program to all who complete it. And also we are uh, seeking support from as many as five colleges and universities for a certificate of some sort and perhaps even um, uh, college credit uh, that could apply to a degree, an undergraduate degree likely at one of those colleges or universities, okay? <coughs> Any questions about the Academy and its overview so far? Then there, as I've mentioned, there are 19, you see them here, there are 19 different programs. Uh, the first two, two in the series are about community health centers. Then um, sometime in August, whenever that date is scheduled, we will look at health and society, That's across the world actually, health as it's perceived across the world, the delivery of health services in the United States, health policy and social determinants, the external and, and internal environments of health care, uh, mission and governance and vision and strategy in health services organizations, those directional strategies that uh, are overseen by our governing body, Common leadership and management competencies. We'll spend some time on the differences between management and leadership and generally speaking, uh, areas where competence is identified. Professionalism, quality improvement and performance measurement. HR and finance functions will be generalized. This will not be in the weeds at all. We're going to be talking about these topics from a very generalized point of view. Use of information and technologies, communication branding and public awareness, and finally, leadership of organization development and change, models for that in community health centers and other health services organizations. So that's just an academy overview, giving you um, 
an opportunity to recall or for those of you who are the first time in the room that helps perhaps to set the stage. Any questions there at all? Any comments? Okay, you sure? All right. Um, sections 329 and 330 of the Public Health Services Act. Um, I encourage you to follow along with the slides and to make notes if you choose. Sections 329 and 330 of the Public Health Services Act. The Public Health Services Act goes back to the 1930s. The Public Health Services Act was amended to include sections 329 and 330 in 1965. Uh, refer to series one, the introduction for uh, the review of the history of community health center movement and you'll see a number of very influential people there, not the least of whom were Dr. Jack Geiger and uh, the late uh, Senator Ted Kennedy involved in the development of community health centers. So these sections of federal law are, under, are what Congress approved to govern the, the way in which grants are applied for, successfully received by, certain types of organizations to provide services in communities of need, medically underserved areas, health professional service areas, uh, where access to care uh, is in some way uh, lacking. Um, in a few moments, we will look at specific slides related to the Department of Health and Human Services, which is, a, which is of the federal government, Human Resources and Services Administration, and then the Bureau of Primary Health Care. So when those of us who have been involved in grant writing activity for the federal government related to CHCs, we know these agencies and bureaus very well. And I'll give you a bit more detail in a few moments, but this is the hierarchy in federal government that, that controls and oversees the manner in which funding comes to organizations, community health center organizations, that uh, uh, apply for and successfully are granted funds to help support what we do. For Affinia Healthcare, uh, just as, a, again, another reminder, about 21% of our total sources of funding comes from these grants. Uh, and these grants are meant specifically to offset the cost offset the cost associated with the care provided to individuals who qualify for discounted fees through our sliding fee scale based upon their household income. For Affinia Healthcare, this is about 94% of our patients. About 94% of our patients have household incomes under 100% of the federal poverty level. About 40% of our patients uh, are uninsured, about 42% of our patients are covered by Medicaid. So a large percentage of our patients qualify for some, some type of discount related to their care based upon their household income, okay? So this is the hierarchy. Um, back to the Department of Health and Human Services. The Department of Health and Human Services uh, has a secretary. The secretary is on the cabinet of the President of the United States. The secretary oversees an incredibly large budget related to federal resources, how our taxes are allocated in ways that support different branches of government. So health care, health services, is under the Department of Health and Human Services. The sitting secretary is uh, Dr. Alex Azar the sitting secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, HHS, as we know it, enhances and protects the well-being, health and well-being of all Americans by providing for effective health and human services and fostering advances in medicine, public health, and social services. And again, the HHS secretary is selected by the president uh, that all secretaries on the cabinet go through a vetting process with the U.S. Senate and if the U.S. Senate approves that person's uh, advancement then that person becomes a secretary on the cabinet of the, the president, whoever the president is. So here's where we start 
the Department of Health and Human Services. It wasn't long ago, it's during my tenure, when we had a secretary, uh, Kathleen Sebelius, dropped by our organization. That's been about six, seven years ago. She was secretary for a good period of time under President Obama. Next in this hierarchy, the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA. HRSA is an agency of government that has something like 18 branches. Eleven of those branches are called agencies and about seven of those branches are called offices. So there's an office of rural health, there's an office of uh, pharmacy benefits policy, there's an office of minority health, there's, a, there's an agency of health care research and quality. Various agencies and offices that fall under HRSA a branch of the Department of Health and Human Services. And this is the agency responsible for improving health to people who are geographically isolated and or economically or medically vulnerable. Generally, the funding that comes through HRSA is in the form of a grant to nonprofit organizations that qualify, okay? HRSA. Now, HRSA has 11 bureaus. One of those bureaus is the Bureau of Primary Health Care, which oversees the health center program. The Bureau of Primary Health Care, its primary charge uh, in the federal government is to administrate the grants that community health centers receive. National network of health centers, 1,400 or so across the country now over the last 55 years, that provide comprehensive primary health to millions of people. Um, I believe that number is roughly 28 million now across the country and approximately one in every six Medicaid beneficiary who's seeking primary care does so in one of these community health centers. So that's the Bureau. Bureau has, uh, the HRSA has 11 bureaus and one of those is Bureau of Primary Health Care, or BIPIC. BIPIC. So say it with, say HRSA with me. HRSA. HRSA. Say BIPIC with me. BIPIC. Try that three times in a row. Say, <laughs> say BIPIC with me. BIPIC. See, so you have HHS, HRSA, and BIPIC. So when those individuals come to survey, to visit, when you see communications, it comes from this hierarchy of the federal government. There are other agencies and departments of federal government that also reach into our, to our organization and offer its support and regulate our activities. We're talking specifically today about what happens under the Department of Health and Human Services related to grants. Okay? Questions at all? Yes, Alma? Mm -hmm. Started off, seemed like Grace Hill was built off of social workers. Yes. It seemed like you got away from that. Did the social work part of it, no, well, did, did behavior help take the place of the social workers that were here helping, helping uh, our patients? So the question is, did behavioral health take the place of social work or social services? that existed in our former Grace Hill? So the answer would be no. However, in, in the grant funding, there are certain required services uh, that, that the federal government requires. And among them would be certain enabling or support services, outreach services to the community. We also receive grants of other types for behavioral health, substance abuse, other kinds of services that aren't related to sections 329 or 330 of the Public Health Services Act. So it wasn't a complete replacement. Uh, the organization of Finia Healthcare is not the same organization it was in the 60s, 70s, and 80s when it was specifically that social services agency. In 1978, I think it was, uh, uh, Grace Hill Health Centers became a grantee under section 320, 330 of the Public Health Service Act. And it was at that particular point in time that our future began to shape around these regulations and the provision of health care 
medical, dental, behavioral health, mental health, enabling and support services. Yes. Thanks for the question. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, is there an additional portion of our budget that comes from private grants, or are they all moved into that same percentage? So, a relatively small, small amount comes from um, state allocations through the Missouri State Legislature. Okay. We also apply for grants through the Missouri, uh, the Missouri Foundation for Health, the Missouri Foundation for Health. Sorry for that momentary oh, lapse. You were at me. The Missouri <laughs> Foundation, <laughs> Missouri Foundation for Health, and other other funders and sources, right? SAMHSA. Right, yeah. SAMHSA. Thank you, SAMHSA. Um, also, we have sources of revenue through different re, uh, reimburse, reimbursement through different insurers, the government and non-government. So, we bill Medicaid, we bill Medicare, we bill commercial insurers. And our patients have a certain level of responsibility based upon their household income to cover a portion of the bill. So all of these, all of these um, sources. You foundations also other foundations as sources of funding. Thank you, Donna. Other foundations as sources of funding besides the Missouri Foundation for Health. Right, there's like uh, family foundations. And yes, like there, it's it's a wide range. They're not those particular funding sources don't encompass a larger percentage of it. A lar the larger percentage of our funding comes through Medicaid reimbursement. Medicaid eligible individuals who come to our organization and we bill based upon their eligibility. So it's a, there are a number of sources. It's a, quite a pie chart. When we get to finance, we'll probably cover that. Uh, I'm pretty sure that we would. Yes? Would you mind sharing? not only because they hold the purse strings, but also as a governing body, uh -huh. guides what programs we have, such as the opioid program, uh, uh -huh. not giving out opioids, uh -huh. the, the MAP program, and, MAT, and substance use and, and abuse, uh -huh. and uh -huh. and uh -huh. sure. I'm not sure how that works. I can. Uh, later in your presentation, we have a series of slides on compliance. And I will get there. But as a precursor, I would suggest that Congress sets health policy for the country. At least health policy as it relates to how our taxes are invested. And then Congress allows the President, through the Department of Health and Human Services, and the agencies and bureaus of that hierarchy, to determine ways in which grant funding is, is distributed um, across, across the nation. Uh, so Congress sets that policy. It decides how that money is invested and where the direction is going. It could be based upon the president's budget, and it might be based upon the strength of a certain legislator or a committee. So a very good example, as you mentioned, Leslie, is the opioid epidemic substance use and abuse, the attention that it's gotten clearly the last three to five years, should have gotten years ago, but it's gotten more so the last three to five years, um, and the problems of 200,000 Americans dying as a result. So this is a major focus of the, of the Congress, and it's a major focus of the President's budget, and so therefore, grant opportunities surface. Some of those are competitive, and some of those just roll out to all community health centers based upon their, their, um, um, their being a member of the group of community health centers that are funded in that way. Hope that helps. Over the last 35 years, I've seen a lot of different ways in which the government has focused specifically focused its attention on various aspects, uh, going back to Ryan White, for example. So there are, there are periods of time when, in which the elected officials vote to determine how these monies are going to be allocated. 
So that's how that works, generally speaking. Okay? Here are the topics we're going to further uh, explore today. And when, when we refer to compliance, we're talking about regulatory compliance. Regulatory compliance. So 21% of our funding comes from Section 329 and 330. That is how that works. Yet the regulations that an organization must follow uh, relate to everything that's under the organization's scope of service. So wherever we are saying to the federal government those grant resources would apply, then the regulations control. So I would suggest to you that somewhere between 95% and 100% of what we do is regulated by uh, the Section 330 law, even though only 21% of our sources of revenue come from Section 330. Um, if you take WIC out of the equation, uh, it's likely that 100% of what we do is controlled directly by these regulations. So it's a big deal, very big deal. So we'll go over these. These are the areas that HRSA and the Bureau through, uh, from Congress have expectations for us. Let's start with governance. Um, you might recall that last year in August, uh, we had a HRSA review for three days. Uh, it went extremely well in our organization. It was August the 5th through the 7th, I believe. Uh, every community health center in the country goes through this type of review at least every three years, not later than every five, five years. And there are elements of compliance. There are 19. You've probably heard this, read this from Leslie Lake, read this from Dr. Kendra Holmes. All of us have heard and talked about these elements because this is how the federal government evaluates whether we have earned the right to receive the grant funding to support the needs here in St. Louis. That's every community health center across the country. So we start with governance. A consumer majority, regardless of the size of the board, and the size of the board is not prescripted. In other words, the government doesn't say, thou shalt have 15 members. Your bylaws can describe, uh, the, the board can decide its size. Normally, boards of directors are between 9 and 25 in number. That's generally speaking between 9 and 25. We have 19 and at least 50% plus one of that group must be patients of our facility. A consumer majority. Patients of your facility, um, every community health center. The governing body, board of directors, sets policy and strategic direction. The strategic plan that grew out of our needs assessment, the needs assessment's your next page, uh, is, is the strategy for growth and development and the future direction of the organization. That is supported by, approved by the governing body. The governing body monitors operational performance of varying types, um, clinical operations, financial operations, quality, there's a slide on quality, uh, oversees quality and safety and assesses and measures risk of various types, employs the chief executive officer in the organization and adheres to certain duties and avoids conflict of interest. I call this out um, to make sure that we understand that board members of governing bodies like Affinia Healthcare's or any community health center must be comprised of individuals who avoid certain conflicts of interest. In other words, if this person represents a company that is uh, contracted with the organization and there's the possibility that that individual would be financially benefited, there would be gain as a result of that person's relationship. That relationship has to be disclosed. That person must uh, avoid the, the rules and the tenets related to conflict of interest. That's just one of the areas that I speak of. But there are certain duties that governing body members have, duties of loyalty and care for the organization. So that's the governing body. I report to them. 
I've reported to governing bodies now. It's my 24th year, I think. And the one at, um, the one at Affinia Healthcare follows the guidelines established by the bylaws. Okay, any questions about that? Needs assessment, a very important piece. Uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, say the academic journals, are concerned about two things, capacity and need. Capacity and need. If we are a nonprofit organization, and in fact, in other words, not owned by someone, and that could be a public entity, need in the community is the first consideration, and your capacity to meet the need is the second. So organizational need, need in the community and organizational capacity. Our needs assessment is population-based. It was conducted last only one year ago in April, May, June of 2018. Several of you in the room today and others who will be uh, participating later have taken a very active interest in the development of our needs assessment. This is also, could also be called strategic planning. If you're looking at it from a business context, this is strategic planning. In health services organizations, it happens every three to five years, generally speaking, we would review, again, our needs assessment. We use primary and secondary data sources and including focus groups of our patients. We look at access to care and utilization data in the community. Health disparities that exist in your community. Um, again, I would probably punt this down the road just a bit, there will be sessions in our academy that relate directly to, to disparities and social determinants. Service needs of the general and special populations and then back to your organizational capacity. These are a few of the areas uh, where your needs as assessment uh, is developed. Uh, there's no a particular prescription, again back to the word prescription, the federal government doesn't say this is how you must conduct your needs assessment. They give you some hints, um, but every organization of the 1400 chooses the ways in which it conducts needs assessment and then later on the federal government looks at what you've done, how you're developing and relates that then to the grant resources for the organization. Uh, it's a rather involved process. Yes? Was the new assessment um, how we, when we went to our Elgin clinic, um, we had training on that? Uh -huh. Did they discover that it was needed in the community? So the question is when we had the last October, September, October, the LGBTQ session. There were two and it was mandated that all of our staff attend at least one of those. That came out of one of our tier two strategies related to our needs assessment. That is correct. It did. Our first tier of strategies at Affinia Healthcare today relate to clinical indicators, the types of activities that we regularly uh, uh, conduct with our patients. The tier two relate to community relationships and partnerships and collaborations and affiliations. And the tier three strategies are those that require broader growth and development and um, the assumption of greater levels of risk, measured risk. So for example, the development of a campus or the movement into a different part of the region such as North St. Louis County. Uh, the creation and um, growth of our Affinia Healthcare Foundation. <coughs> These are examples of tier three strategies, just to be more specific. That's how we do it. It is not necessarily how it's done everywhere. Uh, again, there are different ways of performing needs assessment and strategic planning. I appreciate the questions. Excellent questions, thank you. Moving on, here's what we call scope, scope. I will say here that you are either in scope or you're out of scope and being in scope relates to a specific site and address, a place. We have to submit uh, through our grant application 
processes, where it is services are provided, in other words, where the grant resources will be allocated, and that has to be approved. Um, and whenever you stop providing services at a site, you must also inform the federal government through that hierarchy that you're no longer providing those services there. It's very prescribed, very specific. So the scope is sites, services, and target population. Where are you providing the services and to whom? So there are specific locations, required and additional primary care services. So there was an earlier question kind of related to this. Um, there are certain required services in order to qualify and receive the grant. Please don't ask me to recite what all of those are. I could see it in Dorothy Rogers' eyes. She was, <laughs> she was going to ask, what are those required services? <laughs> all of you can Google just like I can. I probably know some of them. I won't know them all, so I want to qualify. I don't want to make a mistake there and mention one that's not required and have to pay for that later. There are certain required services and then there are certain additional or optional services. Occasionally a required service can be provided by arrangement. So for example, if to receive the grant you must provide or arrange for lab services or radiology services or podiatry, it's not to suggest you have to provide it on site but you have to prove that you have an arrangement that allows patients access to that service. So there are required and there are additional services. The catchment area and underserved target population. So within our grant application, and this is the case for every community health center, we identify by zip code and or county and or ward where services are provided. So therefore, you can find a map in the federal government hierarchy that shows you those bright orange lines around certain geographies where every community health center is granted to provide services. Now for community health centers like ours or any other, it doesn't mean that you can only provide services in that area. It does mean that that's your catchment area, it's where your target population has been identified, and you have an, a responsibility through your mission then to provide services in that target area. That's how the funding was allocated. Now there, please don't be confused here. It's easy to be confused about this. There are other types of organizations that have those bright orange lines and they can't serve people outside of them. That's not our organization. In fact, something like 23% of our patients come from outside of our bright orange line. So patients can come in to where we serve and we can go out from where we serve so long as we've identified that site of service and it has been approved. Otherwise, we are at some risk for not um, being under some of the federal supports, and I'll cover those in a few minutes. I'll stop there just for a moment because those who are recording and assuring that we get this ready for others want me to take a break. So I'm going to take a break. <laughs> Accessible hours of service, that's another element of compliance. It's looked upon very closely. Uh, there are some nuances here. First, remember the governing body sets policy. The governing body sets and approves hours of service, not only where, but how often, when. That's under the auspices of the governing body. So the accessible hours of operation must be relative to where patients live and work Again, remember that bright orange line. Remember this, where your services are provided. Considering potential barriers to care, residential and cultural patterns, not specifically 
defined, by the way, in the regulations, but for your communities, what are residential and cultural patterns? Certain economic and social barriers that may exist in your communities. Travel distance and travel time. Uh, a good question that we're often asked is, where do the buses go? What are the routes? Where do they stop? Uh, uh, yeah, the transportation routes, important in an urban area. Different kinds of questions in a rurally isolated area, but this is uh, the qu types of questions. Uh, availability after hours and for emergent, serv emergent services. So this doesn't mean we must provide after hours care or emergent services, but to identify and explain to the patients how they can access that availability for those types of services. And that also is reviewed by the federal government to assure that you're meeting, in their view, the community's needs. And then continuity of care. Um, hospital privileging is a good example here. In some communities, the physicians who are working in a community health center, are they are the attending staff for the local medical, uh, local hospital. Uh, in, in urban areas like ours, it's a much different kind of dynamic. It's a different referral pattern, so continu continuity of care means something different in varying areas. So we, we explain what that is. All right, any questions about accessible hours of operation? Yes, Alma. Uh -huh. But there are some times they're not in our scope. But I've known for us to um, place them in the scope in order for us to, to serve them. So that's allowed or it's or a... So oftentimes we will send our mobile units to places to care for individuals who are not specifically our patient. In other words, we would not include them in the UDS we would not bill for them like Hazelwood, like Hazelwood School for a back to school fair for example if we are going to places that are out of scope and we are treating those patient those individuals as our patients then I would suggest to you that's problematic because it's out of scope and it places your organization in some risk now I'm unaware if we're doing that, I'll, I'll tell you, but we shouldn't because we must operate within scope. And our vice presidents know that, no doubt about it, our directors know. Yeah. Good question though. Do we go places where we're out of scope? Yes, but we are confined on how we can allocate those grant resources for that work. Those audits are done fairly routinely and the federal government watches that pretty closely. Yeah. Any other questions about that? About scope, accessible hours of operation. Staffing, this is also quite generalized, except where we say, see the term key management or key senior management. There are some jobs and job descriptions articulated in the regulation that are more specific than others. And the federal government's regulators evaluate to assure that your organization has key administrative staff, that you have uh, a sufficient number of staff, and that their competence has been evaluated through your human resources processes and through your policies for licensed independent practitioners. Organizational structure, that's a table of organization. It's where decision rights are and how information is communicated, where departments exist. Uh, staffing in community health centers for licensed clinical professionals, licensed and or certified clinical support staff, and other staff. So we put these in these varying categories, share that with the regulators so that they know that comes through a budgeting process annually and then whenever there's an audit or a survey and we know that it's coming, okay? So for Anafinia Healthcare that serves 
in excess of 43,000 unique individuals a year and has more than 190,000 encounters of varying types, the regulators don't say, therefore you shall have 500 staff members. It, it doesn't work like that. But you must be able to, to inform and describe how these elements are working in relation to the federal support, the federal grant support. So there's quite a lot to it, isn't there? Is there more to it than you thought there was, right? And um, yeah, there's a lot. Quality. Quality is one of our more important aspects of what we do. Most would suggest if they took an exam that quality is the most important thing that we do. There are varying functions in a health services organization. An organization has to be able to demonstrate to its public that it's of a high quality organization, that it's safe and effective and appropriate. So quality, do you have a QI and QA system that you, for monitoring and reporting? And do you assess risks? That's through our compliance department and through quality and through finance. Do you assess risk? Uh, patient satisfaction and patient grievance processes. Patient safety. Patient confidentiality, confidentiality and protected health information through information technologies. Certified electronic health records. These days that is the norm. That's not a new normal, that is an established norm. So if a community health center is in such an area where they're still using paper records and not an EHR, that comes under great scrutiny these days um, over, the, over about the last maybe 10 years. Adherence to evidence-based clinical guidelines. So under this element, quality, there is a great deal of, uh, of activity. Um, I didn't mention, mention earlier, but our board of directors has committees. Most of those committees are established within the bylaws. There are committees that are typical to most health services organizations, whether they are nonprofit or for profit. Generally, quality improvement, human resources or personnel, finance and audit, um, nominating committee. There's always an executive committee that's uh, comprised of the chair of the board, vice chair of the board, secretary, treasurer, and usually an appointee, depending on the size of your board. So those different committees, varying committees, have functions under the board of directors and report through the board of directors, and quality is one of those um, for community health centers. Okay? The par partly the finance side, the establishment of discounted fees and a sliding fee policy and sliding fee scale is a requirement for receipt of these grant funds. This is also a board function that's informed by the finance committee. Every year, the board of directors reviews the sliding fee scale and approves any recommended changes any revisions. Also, the Board of Directors adheres to changes that come out of Congress in where those levels of, of um, poverty level are. So Congress changes those annually and organizations like ours that are grantees um, fold or uh, mold, I should say, mold our uh, policies to the, feder the federal poverty level. So that's one example. Um, there's a budget every year that's both grant and fiscal periods. So our grant period for the Section 330 funds is February 1 through January the 31st. Our fiscal period as a nonprofit entity is January 1 through December 31. I will promise you, right, Leslie, it would be easier if they were the same, but ours are, are, are different. Uh, that budgeting is for both in-scope and out-of-scope services. I haven't made this comment, but a nonprofit organization like ours can choose to operate services out of scope. They don't all have to be. There's no requirement that they are all in-scope. But if we choose to provide services out of scope, 
then I will explain in just a few moments what we would miss. What decisions would be made to be out of scope for a certain service and what would be forfeited or missed as a result, okay? You must prove that you have financial management and accounting systems and a way to bill and collect and procedures for billing and collecting. So that's another function like quality, like human resources, like um, compliance, like operations, uh, like the medical staff function. We have a formalized medical staff at Affinia Healthcare. Another element um, that has certainly gotten a lot of attention the last, I would say, five or six years is affiliation and collaboration. It's necessary that an organization like ours seeks relationships with other political, or rather I should say public and, and non-public, not-for-profit organizations that are serving the needs of communities. So we meet that test through the Integrated Health Network, through the um, Regional Health Commission, through our work with the Missouri Primary Care Association, through contracts with BJC for our work in behavioral health, any of those kinds of contracted collaborations, whether it's an alliance or a joint venture or simply a contract for the provision of services, such as with Washington University or A.T. Still University. These are examples of affiliation and contracted collaboration to prove that organizations work together to benefit the community. And it's looked upon very closely by the federal regulators. Um, I mentioned earlier hospital admitting privileges. That also comes under affiliation and collaboration. I, I recall last August that one of the areas that we needed to fulfill of two after the surveyors for HRSA left was to establish a written contract of service with a hospital for referrals. So our licensed clinicians refer to a number of different facilities. Primarily speaking, the majority of our referral activity is to Barnes Hospital and to BJC, but not exclusively. So it was necessary, given the, given the rules, the regulations, that we establish a written contract for referrals, referral coordination with a hospital. We did that. That was done within 45 days after they left in early August. That was one of the two deliverables following the survey last year. Um, finally, law and regulation just generally speaking. So I've kind of um, been around the edges of this and I want to be more specific about in scope and out of scope. So uh, the law is 329 and 330 of the Public Health Services Act. Additionally, there are other pieces of federal and state legislation law that impact us. When we are in scope through Section 330, we are able to fall under the Federal Tort Claims Act and also the 340B drug pricing program. If we're not in scope, those are two programs in particular that we do not have access to because we're not operating those services in scope. So the, the FTCA, the Federal Tort Claims Act, is federal law that permits our activities, uh, all of our licensed clinicians, all of the activities we do for patients, the professional liability for those services fall under the Federal Tort Claims Act. For all intents and purposes, the government is our attorney on these matters and covers our liability. That's a lot different than it is in nonprofits that are not covered by the FTCA or for profit entities that go out and purchase the liability insurance from insurance companies. That's a huge expense. Ours is offset under the FTCA. Additionally, this 340B 
drug pricing program allows us access to discounted cost, average wholesale pricing for drugs, for prescription medications that come through our pharmacies that are um, administered for the benefit of our patients. So there is a huge benefit for both FTCA and 340B for our organization based upon our, our grant application and funding. Dr. Knipp. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. um, maybe they have private insurance, maybe whatever. Yes. We are not covered by the Federal Court Act? If it's outside of our scope, we are not. So what covers that liability? That you, wouldn't, would you wouldn't be covered. As an employed practitioner or as an independent contractor working to provide services to patients of Affinia Healthcare, you must provide those services at wh where scope covers. So, for example, this is, a, this is a real example, happened in another community in the United States, but it cost the organization a lot of money. A physician was going to a nursing home to make rounds on that every 30 day schedule, Medicare certified nursing home. There was an adverse event. The nursing home was not in the scope of service, even though the patient was a patient of this physician for that community health center. There was a lawsuit, went through court, the community health center lost and paid a substantial sum because the adverse event came, came with a financial penalty and it wasn't covered by the FTCA. So clients that come here and we see at Affinia Healthcare anywhere are automatically in our scope. They, their scope doesn't mean the geography. Okay. Scope means the site of services where, the, where it's performed. So choose any state, uh, choose a state. New York. Choose another state. <laughs> Montana. Montana. <laughs> uh, a person can be driving, <laughs> can be driving through St. Louis, seek our services, they're from Montana, they're seen within our scope if they're seen at that specific site of service. Again, about 23% of all of our patients come from outside of that bright orange line, that geography. Geography is just one component. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Great. Uh, other laws and regulations that that uh, we fall under, that impact us. State regulation and licensing laws in particular, clinicians based upon what the state legislature has said um, can be licensed in the state of Missouri are the people who we contract with or employ. People must be covered under the licensing laws of your state. There are other states, so for example, how Medicaid in the state of Missouri is administered comes under the state legislature. That's an example of a law uh, that, that we abide by as a result of being a f facility, an organization that provides services in Missouri. And then there are state and local regulations. For us, that would be the city of St. Louis that we must abide by uh, occasionally. Uh, yes? I have a question more back to the If they're privately insured, you're asking, would they get it at our price or what their insurance company says? Yeah, like it was a patient. Uh huh. Yes. But then she uh, turned 65, she got on Medicare and had a uh, dentist plan. Mm -hmm. The dentist plan was like $70 and she couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so if she's covered by Medicare, uh, she, well, she's over the age of 64, she no longer qualifies for Gateway to Better Health. Mm -hmm. So therefore, in that particular instance, 
for Anitha, she falls under Medicare, not under Gateway. She would have to abide by the Medicare laws, Medi Medicare regulation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There would be other advantages for that Medicare person, especially when he or she is hospitalized because Gateway won't cover that. So there are advantages and disadvantages anywhere you look at it. But no, that person who was Gateway and no longer is Gateway would not qualify for the gateway benefit. The health insurance world is an incredibly complicated one in and of itself. Um, very complicated. Dr. Knipp. How, how is this um, hard regulation going to flow with the telehealth issue? So we have somebody who is maybe not at our site providing services, uh -huh. sort of at our site. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It is. Dr. Knipp asks, how does telehealth work and all of this in scope and out of scope? So first I would say that telehealth is growing in interest and prominence across all sorts of organizations. Community health centers in rural areas are doing lots of services. So what we've been able to identify that services where a, uh, a patient is. So if the patient comes here at Biddle and the telehealth connection is in Columbia, Missouri. That would be covered because the patient is here and in our scope. Now there are other circumstances um, when it, it gets a little more interesting, um, cloudier. We're tr still trying to understand, uh, for, say for example, the reimbursement angles of telehealth for community health centers because essentially it says in federal law we can't receive reimbursement for services related to tele-technology. So we're trying to work through these, get those kinds of things corrected so that we can be reimbursed for the services that we provide. It's a new and emerging idea for health centers and even health centers that are in urban areas. I look for this to blossom for us in the next three to five years if I were to prognosticate Excellent question. Another excellent question. Are there any others? I note that it is exactly one o'clock. <laughs> are you sure there are no questions or comments? <laughs> Hope to see you next time. Thank you all very much. <laughs>